Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'd like to go ahead and convene and get, get, get going here. Uh, my name is Lee Dirks. I'm the Director for Education and Scholarly Communications and External Research. Uh, and it is my honor to welcome all of you to the beginning of the sessions. Um, we have, um, uh, in this particular session, I think something that will be of great interest to many of you, and it's, uh, I think, two practitioners in the field who have been doing some kind of state-of-the-art uh, work with uh, data, data collection, data management, data sharing. Uh, and I'm going to keep my introductions very short because I think they're going to do a good job of kind of uh, explaining what they're up to and the institutions they're from, et cetera. But uh, first off, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Deb Agarwal from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, to talk about some of the work that they've been doing, uh, collaborative work with uh, research scientists, environmental data gathering and, and analysis um, over the last few years as part of the FluxNet project and, and several other related projects. So I'll hand it over to Deb. Thank you, Lee. Uh, I don't think I'll need it. Okay, so um, this doesn't come as a huge surprise to people, but um, in the eco sciences, what we've really seen is that there's been a big shift, right? And, and the shift that's happening is that uh, you really had the case where people were doing fairly individualistic studies where they'd put some sensors out, they'd study a particular region, they'd write their papers about that region, they'd be off to doing something else. And, and what you're seeing now is you're seeing groups needing to be able to answer regional or global scale questions and needing to be able to pull together much, much more data than they could actually have pulled together in, in any individual research project. And, and so just, you know, these are just some examples of them. This is uh, the fish recovery. Uh, project where you know this is this is the NOAA National Marine Fisheries folks looking at how do we actually try to recover salmon in Northern California, right? They were traditionally there. All of the streams have changed. How do we actually think about recovering? And I'll bring this topic up again and again since this is a group we've been working with. You know, another another case of one of these sort of things is the uh, wildfires, right? So it's been in the news a lot. California has had a lot more wildfires than they have in the past. Uh, being able to look at what's going to happen into the future, you know, not only for civic planning of, you know, how, many, how much do I need in terms of firefighters, but also trying to plan for how do I abate these. You know, if it's going to be a major problem and it's, and it's going to continue to increase, then you start looking at mitigation techniques that you would use. If not, uh, crops are sort of a, um, well, they've been on the agenda all along, but as population increases and the Climate changes, you know, obviously the crops have to change as well, and, and people want to know what, what should I do, right? So those are just some examples of the types of questions that start to come up and, and need the ability to pull together much more data than any one researcher would be pulling together. And it really starts to look at being able to pull together data across disciplines. And that's where the challenge really has, has been in the eco sciences for a little while, and it's, it's just growing. So if we look at this, um, you know, on, on, on all of the surface views of this, we're in a very data-rich environment for the ecosciences, right? And, you know, you've got, you've got a large number of, of data repositories that have been building up with, at the agencies. Uh, so I, I apologize. I know this is a fairly international audience, and I'm, I'm being U.S.-centric, but it's the data I know well. So I, I'll apologize, but that's, that's sort of where... Uh, most of this data that I'm talking about is, is really going to focus. But the issue is, um, so you have, a, you have a broad array of different agency and uh, network groups that are pulling together quite large data sets, right? You also have a lot of very local data sets, right? You still have all these local researchers who have been putting together data for particular studies. You've got corporations, you've got ecological organizations that have been pulling together data to study different issues on local scales, and you still have those individual researchers, right? And, and even, um, you know, in the local agencies, you've got things like the, the different water control boards. You've got uh, water resource agencies, right? Just to name a few that, that we've, we've come across that have a 
fairly significant amount of data that they've collected. So the, the issue that comes in is that this data really comes in many forms, right? It, at first you think, ah, oh, it's just bits, right? Um, but as soon as you look beyond that and you start thinking about how am I going to use these bits, that's where it gets really interesting because this data really is very different. So, you know, this is, this is actually habitat typing. They literally send somebody up a stream to, ha to, to type each of the habitat areas as they go up that stream. Most streams that's happened maybe twice in Northern California. Right? This isn't, this isn't a, you know, every, every month we have data, every week we have data, anything like that. Uh, but then at the other extreme, you've got satellites, right, where they're, they're making daily overpasses and, and producing a dramatic amount of data there. But it's all raster, right, because it's taking images. You've got models, you've got, the, you've got more traditional sensors, you've got people going out and making, making individual samples. Uh, then you've got sort of this more, well, a little less reliable data on the, you know, things like fish counts, right? We all know, trying to go out and count a bunch of fish, it's non-trivial to manage to get this accurate. Uh, and, and one of the more emerging things, you heard about it a little bit in the keynote, are things like these ubiquitous sensors, right? Where typically, uh, the reason why I, I view those as something different is, here you're, you're tending to put up a sensor where you've spent a great deal of time on one sensor getting the most accurate instrument you can get, putting it in the best possible location, calibrating it out to the, the nth degree, and then you've got this thing where I'm just spraying sensors out into the, into the mix, and, and my most important feature is that they're cheap, right? And then I can put many out there. And so the data is very different from these two types of sensors. And you've got a great deal of historical photographs when you start being and wanting to pull this stuff together. So the challenge is really trying to bring this stuff together. Um, so just trying to, it, we've, we've been trying for the last several years to figure out how we can pictorially show you what, how hard this is to bring together. And this is my attempt at trying to do this. So if we started, you know, so this, this happens to be the Russian River in Northern California. If we start with, okay, I've got the USGS stream gauges on the, in the Russian River watershed, right? So here's a, here's a view of sort of what I have there. This is some other data that the National Marine Fisheries folks have. This is fish presence data. And this literally is, they, they have this, they call it IP, inherent presence data. And what they're doing is basically if a fish has been spotted somewhere in a stream, then, then basically the, 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 the space of the stream up to that point, actually it's inherent potential. The, the, the space of the stream up to that point must have inherent potential for allowing coho to, to live in that stream, because it made it up to there, right? So this data is, is really hard to define from a computer science standpoint, right? It's, it's not this basic, it's, it's just this one point, it's, it's actually trying to em embody a whole lot of information, and it's, it's got a, it's, it, it actually ends up having a historical component as well, because it's, that particular fish's age tells you something about the, the inherent potential uh, for several years. Satellite data comes in, right? So these are the rasters on a completely different um, geographic axis resolution. Uh, here, we, here is just a picture showing you, uh, so they, they come through and they do cross sections of the rivers, right? To start, start actually being able to look at what does is, what is this river actually look like if we, if we get down into it. So these, this is just showing you where some of the cross sections have been done. So these cross sections exist. And those tend to be done very infrequently. Uh, this is just some other data that happens to be from 1997, not tied to, to much of any particular place. It's just tied to a particular stream. Uh, this then is stream temperature gauges. And these are actually from um, the, the water resources groups, the, um, the timber groups. And what's interesting about these as well is that you don't necessarily know exactly where it's located. There's a lot of reasons why that's, that, that actually becomes obvious after a few minutes because the lumber company and the, the timber company and the water resources board and especially the private landowners would really not like you to know that that temperature anomaly happened right outside of their property. 
because then you might actually want to come in and cause them to change something. And they don't really want to change it. So in fact, on most of these sort of gauges, you don't know exactly where it is. You know roughly where it is. Uh, so you know, this would be very typical data from the, the water agency, right? This is just showing their water distribution system. And then you have all these, these other man-made uh, artifacts that sit within the you know, stream. So, so this happens to be an inflatable dam. Uh, that happens to be some infiltration pools that are being used by the water agencies. And, and so what's the challenge? Well, the challenge is really trying to be able to integrate this data. You've got point and sp spatial data, you've got time series, you've got low frequency, you've got another issue is, is the ontology of the data, right? Uh, different groups collecting the same data often use different vocabulary for that data, right? So it's, it, it looks like the typical ontology problem. It's, it gets a little trickier than the typical ontology problem because there's, there's, more, um, there's more to how they've, how they've used the different terms. Um, a great deal of this data is very sparse in time or duration or location. So what are some first things you can do, right? So, so first off, you can take all the time series data, and that's actually where we started about three years ago. So we said, well, the time series data seems fairly straightforward to help people organize. So we went through and, and actually took it and said, okay, well, it's got a lot of natural dimensions to it. It's got the, the time dimension. It's got the sites where it was collected. Uh, it's got its data type, things like that, that, that are very natural dimensions across all the data sets. Um, people tend to want to look at this data in fairly common ways. And so they want to be able to look at yearly, monthly, aggregates, stream, you know, across a stream, um, be able to do filtering so that they can look at just particular data associated with, say, a watershed. Um, they want to be able to search for specific characteristics in that data, and they want to be able to browse and display it. And so I'll walk through some of the tools we built early on in the projects. Uh, so, so first off, we, we actually, in, in conjunction with Microsoft, uh, we worked on, on actually putting this data into data cubes. So data cubes allow you to actually do that, where you can, where you can slice the data along its natural dimensions and provide browsing capability. So you can do things like Excel pivot tables directly off of the data cube. Right? So what, what that allowed is now all of a sudden we could give a researcher an ability to just walk through that time series data, look at different aggregations very easily. Of course, there's a bunch of researchers who said, well, but Excel? And so what, what we did is we actually built an equivalent interface to go to MATLAB, and I'll, I'll show that in a little bit. Um, the other piece here is starting to look at how you can use the reports and some of the, the standard reporting capabilities that are already built into the databases for commercial purposes to use those for being able to display some of this data as well. But the problem is you still have all this non-time series data, right? So you've got a lot of things, as I showed you, that is, that's one time or infrequent in terms of when it's collected. So uh, you know, looking at it within a data cube is a little bit odd because I have to peg it to a particular time if I'm going to use it in the data cube where I've got a dimension of time. Um, a lot of these are actually approximate measurements. Right? You think about biology, you think about some of these, some of these things we're trying to measure, and, you know, one of, them, one of them that's a perfect example is LAI, which is leaf area index. Right? If I'm trying to measure leaf area index, there is one way I can be absolutely accurate. I can cut down the tree and I can measure every leaf. Okay? Yes, I can be accurate. Of course, I will never have another measurement of LAI. <laughs> so what do they do? They measure how much sunlight gets through. They measure you know, a bunch of other properties. How big is this tree? What is its, you know, its average leaf area? Things like that, and they come up with a, an approximate measure of this. But it's going to be a range, right? That's completely typical that they've got a lot of things that are ranges. Things like these data cubes, not particularly well suited to, to handling a range. They expect a number pegged to some particular place. Uh, the raster images, the photographs, those are, those are clearly pretty hard to deal with as well. Model output. Uh, not because it isn't a time series, but because the time series is not necessarily pegged to a particular time. 
as in it's not necessarily 1997, it might be just an average year, right? So how do you use that against, uh, against data that in fact is pegged to specific times? The GIS information shapefiles, right? A lot of our ecological data has in fact already been imported into GIS either because the group happened to have a GIS expert or because it naturally fell in, a, in geologic space. And so, in fact, the, you know, that IP information that you see there is, is from the National Marine Fisheries folks, and it's in fact, you know, that is a GIS image, because that's what they do. So another interesting thing about this, um, when we look at, at how, how the data doesn't necessarily fall in the, you know, in the simple categories, uh, when we're looking at the fish, the fish actually have different stages of growth, and those really matter, right? So, so you could, you know, one way you can imagine dealing with this is that you redefine time, <coughs> right? So now I'm going to define time in terms of the different rearing stages of it. That's one way you could potentially deal with it, but there's, there's a whole lot of different issues there because I want, to, I want to be able to look at things in terms of that time period, right? During the rearing time, were the, were the conditions right? During uh, the, you know, the, what else do we have? During the emergence, you know, were the conditions right? Because it's different conditions that are critical in each of the life stages. And so it really matters to be able to peg it to the life stage. But this, this also kind of shows you some of that difficulty of actually managing to measure these things, right? I mean, just even in these photographs, it's, it's clear that, you know, if I was standing in the stream trying to count these fish going by, non-trivial. And they haven't gotten that good at sensors yet for these things. So as I mentioned, um, we did the data cube as a start on this. You know, then we hit all the rest of this data. Uh, what, we've, what we've done as a beginning on this is we've actually uh, done a lot of mashups. Right? So then you can actually peg this stuff to, uh, to a map. Uh, this, this happens to be using virtual Earth. Uh, obviously, you can do it in the Google Maps as well. But you know, we're at a Microsoft conference. We did it in virtual Earth. Um, we love virtual Earth. <laughs> Oh, is that my, my requisite Microsoft plug? <laughs> Excellent. Um, what I'm showing over here is actually uh, what we've also done is taken the data cube and connected it to ArcGIS. Right? So that gives you a GIS connectivity to all your GIS data. The issue there was that in ArcGIS, it's really bad at dealing with time series. Right? You can't, um, I don't even want to get into how bad it is to try and put together the, the time series input file you have to give ArcGIS to make the thing play forward a, a time series. Um, whereas by just connecting it to the data cube, Bill Winter from the, the National Marine Fisheries Group actually built all the ArcGIS side of things. And now we can actually, you know, you can, you can actually see the different time series or you can look at the annual values for any particular year <coughs> just through the ArcGIS interface. And, it's, and it goes off and queries the data cube behind the scenes. Um, these mashups were all for just being able to show things about particular data sites, but obviously you can do a lot more. And if you look at SciScope, there's actually a, a lot more that um, Bora Baran has done in, within Microsoft to look at, at sort of how you can really expand the amount of programming and, and knowledge behind that interface. So what I want to switch to now, so, so that up till now was really all about how do I get the data? How do I put it into a common framework? How do I start to understand it? But as I told you at the beginning, the real thing that I'm going after is how do I do data synthesis? How do I answer these regional and global scale problems? Once, you know, how do I figure out answers to these things once I have all this data together? And, and just, just even putting together the story of what it takes to do this is enough to send any grad student or postdoc into, <laughs> into running away from their, their, their advisor as fast as they can. Uh, because the reality is, the amount of time required to get through this whole process of gathering up all the data, converting it into the units and the, and the spatial um, resolution that you need, gap filling it, quality assessing it, talking to the, the, the people who gathered it to make sure that you're, you're using it for appropriate usage and what the limitations on that data are. Then finally doing your analysis, right? I mean, you're already at least a year into things just to get to here. 
right? Then performing the analysis, and you're not done. The next year is trying to figure out how to publish that thing. Because the reality is, scientists are very, it's very easy to get them to share their data. What's actually non-trivial is getting them to explain to you what you have to do to have appropriately acknowledge them for having given you that data so that you can actually publish this, this and synthesis result. And, and you know, think about it from the computer science perspective. Think about it as 20 years ago in software, right? I've worked with Jan, Van Jacobson, right? You know, he wrote a ton of, of original software, put it all out on the web. Nobody thought anything of it. Everybody contributed in. It just, it just worked. Then all of a sudden we came along and said, well, we've got to have these copyright and licensing things. 98% of Van's code could never be copyrighted, licensed, anything. Right? In fact, we could never distribute it again just because of this fact that it, it had, you couldn't clean it up anymore. You couldn't figure out who you had to get the OKs from. A lot of this eco-science data is in that same position today. And so what happens is you get to the end of this analysis and you start having to eliminate data that you had used because you can't figure out how to, how to properly acknowledge it and, and publish with it. And, and ideally, you do get to that publish the paper. But you know, as I just said, you're almost two years into this process for one analysis. That's what we got to fix. And we got to fix both ends. Because I put this up as just one example. So there's, uh, there's this database called CRIS that, that some folks put together in California. And they go through watershed by watershed, gathering the data and, and actually trying to uh, create this whole database of sort of being able to gather all the data in one place. I went through and I tried to figure out, because I used some Chris images, and I, I went through and tried to figure out exactly who I had to acknowledge and exactly what citations I needed to put in. I gave up. This is three quarters of their references. OK, so I figure I'm, I'm close enough to cover. <laughs> but you know, reality is, your paper can be an entire just references at the end of a synthesis effort. And that's the problem. So I want to end with a challenge. And the, the challenge is that we really need to figure out how to create the web of data. So it's not just being able to bring all that data into one common reference, although that's an incredibly important challenge. We also need to be able to figure out how to create all the connectivity between that data and all the, all the framework that has the, the proper citations, acknowledgments, and all those things so it's just natural. right? When I pick up a piece of code today, I find the copyright, I find the licensing restrictions, I find all those things right there with it. Right? We built that up over time. Same thing's got to happen in the eco sciences. And I think Bill's been doing an excellent job in starting down a lot of that path. So I'm, I'm hoping he'll tell us some of the answers. Um, but you know, a lot of concentration has been put on archiving the data. The reality is that just the front end of all of this. Because you really need to be able to connect the data publications to it, connect the analyses to it, and make it so that it is a web, that I could actually go from the data to all the analyses that used it, to all the publications that resulted from it, and I can start to do the same thing I can do with papers today in, in a lot of the fields, right? I want to be able to then connect those papers all the way through to the data. And not just the, the data that they used, that little subset of data they used, but all the way back to the source data that you, so that you could go from the source data and trace through and see how that data has been used. Because that's what synthesis and really enabling synthesis is going to require. Um, and, and that's going to require ca capturing those analysis artifacts. And we've been working with the California Digital Library folk and uh, the Moore Foundation on, on some ideas there. Um, you know, capturing all these data corrections and gap fills and quality assessments that everybody's done in their analyses, it's going to be absolutely critical being able to do that and linking those together. Because the reality is today, one of the reasons why the data providers are afraid to share their data is because they're not going to get credit for it. And if we don't fix the, the ability to have that when you stick your data out there, in the same way that when I publish a paper, if it was cardinal, I know that anybody later on is going to be able to look and see how many times it's been cited and how important that paper was. And that makes me much more willing to make sure that the text of that paper is out there so that people can read it and they can cite it. 
right? Same sort of thing with data. We need that same sort of capability. And so I also want to acknowledge most of our contributors. I, I don't yet have the California Digital Libraries folks on there and more in some of these, but, but this at least gives you some feel. We've actually been working with a fair number of collaborations. I mentioned the National Marine Fisheries folks. Uh, Lee mentioned the, uh, the Flex collaborations and actually Marty Humphrey, who's over in the, in the corner there, has been instrumental in a lot of that work with uh, SharePoint and making reports easily accessible. <coughs> um, and Catherine Van Ingen has really been key from the, from the Microsoft end. She's actually been a key technical contributor with us and not just a, uh, not, not just a bystander <laughs> cheering on Microsoft. Uh, so it's, it's really been a big team. So that's all I had and I want to turn it over to Bill. I think, I think we were going to wait for questions till afterward. Okay. Thank you very much, Deb. Appreciate it. So I'll, um, I'll invite uh, Bill up. I think I saw the beads of sweat starting to form on his forehead when Deb said he was going to give us some answers. So <laughs> he's, uh, I know he's, uh, I guess in a lot of ways, just starting the journey that I think Deb has been uh, working on for a while. But uh, I'll introduce Bill. He's uh, from the University of New Mexico, and he is uh, uh, the lead PI for the uh, DataNet project recently awarded by, um, by NSF um, for Data One, which is um, a very broad and all-encompassing uh, one of the DataNet projects responsible for data curation and data, data preservation of scientific data. And so I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Bill. Okay, thank you, Lee. So in the next few minutes, what I'd like to do is basically cover four topics. And as you can probably tell from the list of the topics here, when I put together the talk, I was sort of had the um, glasses half empty uh, mode. Uh, and that mostly I talk about challenges. Uh, I start off with some of the science challenges that we face in the environmental sciences. I talk about some of the cyber infrastructure challenges. And then I'm going to introduce Data One, which is one of the two data net projects that's been funded by NSF um, last fall. We got underway in about October. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the um, approaches that we're tackling with the Data One project. And, and then finally, I'm going to come back to some challenges again with respect to Environmental Science 2020 and talk about some of the new directions in the sciences and how that relates to some of the CI challenges that we have currently to deal with as well. So first of all, from the science side of it, um, I think it's, there's no doubt that we have a lot of environmental science challenges ahead of us, uh, not only from the scientific standpoint, but these also uh, clearly affect society as well. And issues like climate change, biodiversity loss, a whole array of these are not just interesting science questions, but they have huge, huge implications for uh, society, economics, and so on. The, um, <clears throat> this one slide, I think, really summarizes a lot here, and that a lot of you may have seen the Al Gore movie, Inconvenient Truth, and you heard about the hockey stick diagram and so on for CO2. But interestingly enough, that same diagram applies to a whole array of things. It applies to, for example, CO2, as I mentioned, temperature, population growth, uh, nitrogen in the environment, particularly in uh, aquatic sources, and then energy use as well. And the real challenge that we all face is you can see about 1950, uh, we have started to exceed the historic range of variability with respect to all of these major environmental drivers. So we are truly in uncharted waters with respect to the future here. So this pretends, I think, uh, a real need to change the way that we do science and to really focus on data intensive research, which uh, we've heard about already. Um, those drivers have a tremendous number of implications for uh, earth processes, and just a few of them here, a couple that affect us, uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation Triggering. You've clearly heard about the ice sheet uh, stability, the stability of coastal or Amazonian forests, and 
a whole array of factors that we simply don't know uh, what the implications of these changing environmental drivers will have. So lots of science to perform here. Consequently, we need data from a whole array of scales. And I refer to this as the knowledge pyramid or how we build it, but it requires uh, clearly the broad scale remotely sensed data that Deb showed previously in her efforts. Um, increasingly, we're taking advantage of a lot of citizen science networks. Um, a couple of examples here that we're working with in the Data One project, uh, the USA National Phenology Network out of the USGS, focusing on plant phenology. And then secondly, another one is eBird, and I'll talk a lot more about eBird in the remainder of the talk, but that's uh, a project out of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. In addition, we have literally hundreds of uh, field stations, marine labs, uh, natural history collections, and so on throughout the U.S., and then thousands when we go worldwide. And then increasingly, we are um, adding in a number of intensive research sites. The Long-Term Ecological Research Program has 26 sites associated with um, the U.S., including Antarctica, uh, French Polynesia, and a couple other places. And then NEON is the National Ecological Observatory Network, which is getting underway now and will be built out over the next few years. But we have Ocean Observatory Initiative. We have uh, a whole array of other uh, environmental observatory networks that are being developed worldwide to provide a lot of that intensive understanding at place-based uh, uh, sites. So, again, a couple of you may have be familiar with this book here, um, but I, I would argue that in order to get to the point where we really are doing data intensive scientific discovery, particularly in the environmental sciences, we have four challenges that we really need to address. And I'll go through each of these individually. But first is data entropy, discovery, heterogeneity, and then interpretation. And the title of this session was actually the, the large data challenge. And I have to say I would argue, and I think Deb would agree with me, that it's not a real challenge associated with the size of the data that we're dealing with in the environmental sciences yet. It's more of a problem of heterogeneity and complexity. So I think that's where a lot of the future research uh, in computer science and elsewhere will be uh, headed. Data entropy, I put together this slide back in 1997 when I first wrote a paper on metadata in the environmental sciences that led to uh, some of the national uh, standards that we have currently. And the point being that most scientists are familiar with their data at the point of publication. They've gone through this entire um, rigorous process in terms of acquiring the data, uh, doing the QAQC, a whole array of processing, analysis, exploration, uh, visualization, and so on. And at the time of publication, that's when scientists truly are familiar with the database that they constructed. Uh, however, the problem being that a lot of that insight and knowledge is lost over time. And what happens is, you know, the typical case, scientists lose track of those specific details. They may forget exactly what processes were used to convert one uh, data source to an intermediate product or to a final product. Uh, over time, a lot of the general details are lost with respect to maybe even where some of the sampling sites were and so on and so forth. We have retirements, career changes. Anyway, the point being with this is that the natural tendency for a database or a data set or data table is to undergo decay over time. And there are steps that we need to take in order to prevent that from happening. Secondly, data discovery is a real chore uh, currently. Um, I show on the left, we have, uh, for the environmental sciences, we have somewhere in the range of tens to hundreds of uh, repositories worldwide. Um, LTR, again, is a good example, Avian Knowledge Network out of Cornell, and several environmental research networks as well. And they all tend to be somewhat stovepiped in terms of how they um, acquire and manage data for particular communities. Um, the next one. We have, again, thousands of institutions worldwide where data are being collected. In some cases, the data may or may, well, the data may or may not be uh, 
deposited at those places where they're acquired. So the data may actually disappear from those, or in some cases they may be uh, filed away. Um, but scientists, the individual scientists, do things in a very idiosyncratic manner. Uh, data are stored on uh, notebooks and file cabinets. Uh, one of the most uh, valuable data sets that I saw in China was actually a, um, a centuries old biodiversity plot data set that uh, was on paper and sitting on a windowsill uh, <clears throat> right next to a place where there were clearly moisture problems and so on, but an incredibly valuable data set that the, you know, I had questions about in terms of the longevity of it. Um, hundreds of thousands of citizen scientists, again, people collecting data and maybe in their backyards uh, or on um, you know, hikes through the woods or whatever, but a lot of people have that sort of natural historian or natural scientist tendencies to want to collect data, but do those data ever see the light of day? Um, one of the real challenges, I think, that is preventing a lot of synthesis from occurring is this issue of data heterogeneity. And this is an extremely simplified case here. This is actual. It's from uh, the northeastern U.S. where two scientists were collecting quite similar data uh, for tree species in, uh, again, New England, but they use very different formats, they use uh, very different data models, and they have different meanings associated with the parameters that are collected. Uh, what this means is that it's actually a fair amount of work in terms of integrating these two very simple data tables. Uh, one person's uh, metadata, in this case, is the other person's data. So we have to be able to go back and forth between, again, the data and metadata in order to develop two data sets that can be uh, integrated into a, a synthetic one. Data interpretation. Um, as we deal with a lot of the issues with respect to complex data, and as we increasingly deal with larger and larger data sets, it's increasingly uh, more important that we have analytical tools and visualization tools in particular to deal with the, uh, that complexity. And there are a number of issues associated with this. I show a couple of examples here. The one on the left is uh, from VizTrails, from Julianne Ferrer's group at University of Utah. She's here at the meeting. And then uh, Kepler is a scientific workflow solution on the right. Um, they serve an incredibly valuable purpose in terms of being able to uh, archive sort of that workflow that goes, uh, that is conceptualized by the scientists and going from data to results. Um, a couple of areas for improvement here clearly lie in the area of um, tracking the data provenance and making that information uh, easily available and digestible as well. So I'm going to shift gears and talk about Data One for just a few minutes and introduce this project. Uh, this, again, is one of the two um, data nets that has been funded initially by NSF. There are two or three or four more. I'm not sure how many. It will be funded uh, later this year, hopefully. And we are uh, following a couple steps here. One is, um, we recognize that a lot of infrastructure does exist already, so we're trying to build upon that cyber infrastructure that is already in place, those data repositories that exist. So what we're trying to do there, again, take advantage of those, but provide a lot of the glue solutions that help them interoperate with one another. Secondly, we are creating some new cyber infrastructure as well, which I'll focus on in the next slide. And then third, and probably most importantly, is we're focusing on the community to practice. Uh, there's a huge amount that needs to be done to change the socio-culture of science. And this includes presenting them with, or exposing best practices for managing data, uh, doing a lot of education. Uh, science nowadays is truly requires uh, a lifelong learning uh, in order to take advantage of the new technologies and to help us deal with a lot of these huge challenges that we face. Um, I'll show a couple other here, but this, this is sort of our 
um, modus operandi with respect to data one. We're again engaging scientists in the data curation process. We support all aspects of the data life cycle. Uh, a huge amount is focused on the uh, data stewardship, data sharing, best practices, engaging citizens in science. What better way to educate folks about the practice of science than engaging citizens in the process itself? And then focusing a lot of effort on developing domain um, agnostic solutions. So some of the um, um, new infrastructure that we are developing is one, we are um, incorporating existing data repositories plus allowing other new repositories to come online. And we refer to these as member nodes. And these are a whole uh, diverse array of institutions ranging from libraries to universities to research networks to state, federal, international agencies and so on that uh, have holdings of data and they probably deal with a specific community, maybe population ecology of birds or um, ocean observatory type data and so on and so forth. Um, and typically they have resources for managing and curating their data as well as uh, oftentimes dealing with the user base. The uh, second component that I show in the blue triangles here are what we refer to as coordinating nodes. And these are the, um, the network-wide infrastructure that essentially serve as the repositories for metadata catalogs. This is the way you discover data wherever it may exist. And then a lot of the network-wide services are supported through coordinating nodes as well. This is the indexing, the replication, uh, and so, so on. There's a third piece that really goes out to try and meet the needs of the scientists and the students and the others directly, and that is providing an investigator toolkit that includes some tools that are commonly used by scientists in the environmental sciences. So some of these are databases, others are analytical workflow solutions, and very soon we hope to be offering some uh, open source add-ons for programs like Excel that are very commonly used in the environmental sciences community. And then finally, I touch upon this again a little bit later as well, but one of the um, one of the solutions that we're trying to provide right off the bat is a, a portal so that scientists can very easily discover the data products that they need in order to do these large integration and synthesis efforts. So this is our initial grouping of member nodes and coordinating nodes that we'll be bringing online over the next couple of years. And we anticipate uh, and have actually had contact with a lot of folks around the world that would like to uh, establish member nodes and coordinate nodes in uh, different countries and continents and so on. So how are we doing this? Um, we have sort of um, four or five uh, allied approaches that we're engaged in. One is we're engaged in the community uh, first and foremost and we've issued a number of assessments to the environmental sciences communities and others will be forthcoming and we're certainly taking advantage of a lot of those assessments particularly those done through Digital Curation Center and others that have already um, been completed. Uh, we have a work grouping, working group focused on usability uh, that will be looking at the tools that we develop through the project to make sure that they truly meet the needs of the community and they're easy to use. And then third, we're uh, in the, this December, we'll be standing up uh, an initial Data One Users group that will be an international group to help guide the development of the project. We are building on, again, a lot of existing cyber infrastructure. I show a lot of the tools here uh, that cover all aspects of the data lifecycle. And again, it's important to note that we recognize that commercial tools like Excel, MATLAB, and others are very widely used in the environmental sciences, and we need to support uh, those as well. Uh, and probably the important thing is that Data One is helping these tools to be incorporated into um, a broader infrastructure. Education, absolutely key. Uh, again, it's, um, it needs to be uh, career long in terms of uh, melding the cyber infrastructure tools at our disposal to help address some of those grand science challenges. 
We're focusing initially on a couple of things. Uh, one is best practices, and we had a workshop um, a couple of weeks ago to, in, to initially populate this database, but this is to provide scientists with a lot of those best practices that they need. So how do you, um, how's the best way to create a spreadsheet? Uh, how's the best way to, um, you know, what should you use for metadata? Uh, and so on and so forth. And we have, uh, I think, about 50 or so of these run off the bat. In addition, a lot of scientists simply aren't aware of the tools that are at their disposal. Uh, so if they want to use something like a scientific workflow tool, they may have significant lack of understanding about what exists, where to find it, how to use it. So we've developed a tools database as well that we'll be releasing this fall, which points scientists to the appropriate tools that they can use for whatever problems they have. Engaging citizens in science is key. Um, with Data One, again, we're focusing on the USGS National Phenology Network projects on the left, Project Budburst and uh, National Phenology Network. And then on the right, we have uh, eBird, Project Feeder Watch is uh, shown there, and a whole array of other similar citizen science type programs that can be used, um, again, to directly engage citizens, students, and others in science. And then finally, just to come back to this, um, we've been working on a simple user interface. We also have a much more advanced search interface as well, where you can really couple down temporally, spatially, and so on in, in order to get the data sets that you particularly want. And we've been populating that. So we've initial, our initial member nodes have contributed some 70,000 data products uh, that we'll be releasing again sometime this fall when we uh, stand up the website. Um, a key element of our project that actually was not in the proposal but we added on after the fact is something we called the Exploration, Visualization, and Analysis Working Group. And this was a great way to engage the community of scientists in terms of helping to drive Data One. So we started off tackling some grand science questions and saying, okay, what do we need in order to answer these? So the first one that we chose was trying to really, for the first time, get a handle on continental scale bird migration. And amazingly enough, the ornithologists and others that study birds and so on say that there's really very, very little known uh, in terms of real science data that um, you know, underlies bird migration uh, ecology. So this gives an example here uh, this is a look at the indigo bunning, and one of the things you'll notice is you'll start to see it show up there on the Gulf. Uh, the white are the summer breeding populations. Things like Atlanta show up as dark spots because the birds are avoiding that particular or cities. <coughs> this process um, has been, I think, about four months in the making to uh, go through developing this. This now handles most all of the bird species in North America. It involves citizen science data. We have 130,000 observers that contributed data to this uh, particular database. Uh, we use VIS trails, which I mentioned before, that underlies the, um, the fairly complex uh, workflow solution that underlies the, the simple visualization that you see here. Um, we have developed uh, with a team of statisticians um, a, what's called a spatial temporal exploratory model. Um, and then we've incorporated, I think, 41 different data layers into this analysis so far. And what this does, interestingly, is it meets the needs of scientists to answer a whole slew of questions. So you can actually experiment with this particular database. You can do things like uh, ask a question if, let's say, what happens if you advance greening date by two weeks? How would that affect the uh, migration ecology of indigo bunnings. So scientists are just chomping at the bit to be turned loose with this terabyte plus size database. Um, so I'm going to go back and sort of coming back to the end game here, I wanted to sort of revisit some of those challenges that I mentioned initially, but put it in the context of some real science case studies, and particularly in areas where I think we have uh, a lot of work to go. First of all, conserving the world's 
biodiversity. Um, data truly are fundamental for this. Uh, we have, a f how many people know how many species are out there in the world? Any guesses? Let's forget bacteria and viruses, but in, is there a guess in the audience here? Someone throw out a number. 10 million, good, good guess. Current estimates are that there are somewhere between 3 million and 100 million individual species, excluding bacteria and viruses. The best guesses put it probably in the 10, 15, 20 million range. Uh, of that, we have roughly cataloged, or actually named, somewhere around one and a half million of those, plus or minus 10 or 20 percent. So we, if you take the low end, we still have a long way to go. If there are only three million species out there, excluding bacteria and viruses, we still are less than halfway there. Uh, if it's more like 100 million, we have a heck of a long way to go. So data truly are fundamental to this. Um, we have a lot of technological solutions that can help us out with respect to this, but the bottom line is, is that individual species and or specimen records that may just not have been digitized still in some way have to be manually handled. This is an awful lot of work. Names are fundamental. Uh, why I said that there was one and a half million named species plus or minus 10 or 20 percent is that uh, we have um, lots of inconsistencies with respect to taxonomies that are used, as well as the lack of consistencies across taxonomies that are employed in the scientific community. And then a real biggie is with respect to genetically modified organisms. So, and this has huge implications health-wise, agriculture-wise, and otherwise. Uh, in terms of how we name species that have been modified in some way, shape, or form. So what are some possible solutions there? I think uh, there's a lot that can be done maybe with citizen science and crowdsourcing type approaches, uh, but clearly some of the emerging social uh, web and link-based data technologies can have uh, some positive uh, impact here as well. Um, Acoustic monitoring for conservation, and this sort of goes um, actually quite broad, but I'm going to give one example here just focused on African elephants, and this is from the work of Peter Rigi at uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and if you want to look this up on the web, it's called the Elephant Listening Project. It's been underway for just about a couple years now, and it's actually a phenomenal project. Um, one of the difficulties with African elephants is despite their size, you can't see them. They are incredibly difficult to see. Uh, they're in an extremely dense forest, but the one thing you can do is you can hear them. They tend to make a lot of noise. Uh, and that's not just from tromping around, but it's also the way that they communicate with one another. So much of what we know about the ecology of elephants actually comes out of this elephant listening project. We know a lot about their uh, breeding behavior, uh, their distribution, uh, habitat preferences, and so on. There's a lot of focus now on this because uh, there's a lot you can do by understanding elephants through listening for them. Uh, so again, things like presence, absence, um, um, and, and so on and so forth. So this, um, let's see if I can get this to work here. This is uh, one um, acoustic listening device that's been put out near a water and hole. Okay. And we'll probably hear a roar soon that chases us all out of the room. But um, anyway, the, the point being with this, I think we're getting into the, so <clears throat> one of the things that is apparent here, if you look, uh, these are different species groups, frogs, birds, uh, let's see, elephants are down here, and that's the subsonic range that a lot of elephants use for communication. 
This is how they uh, communicate with their clans of fellow elephants. Um, and at roughly the, the subsonic noises go somewhere between two and four kilometers. So it's a great way for them to track themselves in these dense uh, rainforests. But there are some significant challenges associated with this. Uh, one is, um, you know, you need to collect as much data as possible. So, so far, let's see, what have there been? 216,000 hours per year being collected just with the number of listening devices they have out currently. Uh, that's an awful lot of data. Uh, it takes, uh, there's a lot of visualization tools have been brought into this, as I just showed on the previous slide. But in addition, there's a fair amount of uh, manual interpretation that ne is necessary to take place. So uh, roughly 10% of the uh, data acquired in terms of time, it takes that much to analyze it. So there are clearly some approaches there for automated solutions, semi-automated solutions that I think can help out in this regard. But this is uh, one major area where I think we can see a lot of CI research that can go into helping out with this, I think, what is inarguably a grand environmental challenge. Okay, I wanted, um, the third example I wanted to go through was um, assessing and mitigating environmental risk. And clearly some of you may have heard of the little oil spill out in the Gulf, uh, but that raised a lot of questions in terms of impacts on species. And we held um, a mashup a couple months ago uh, to begin to try and address this. And this was through, again, support through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and a number of other groups um, to pull together the database that could help us understand what some of the risks were for key species in uh, the Gulf region. And clearly, um, one that's gotten a lot of notoriety is the brown pelican here. So this shows us zooming in to uh, Grand Isle here. And each one of these blue spots is uh, a rookery with a, a count of a number of brown pelicans associated with that. Uh, as part of this mashup, we were able to bring in data from NOAA. Uh, this showed the initial distribution of the oil spill. And then we were able to do 24-hour for forecasts, again, through NOAA and NASA combined there, 48-hour. Uh, and then 72 hour, and you'll notice that the, uh, once uh, a rookery is within the impact, potential impact zone, an area of risk, then it uh, turns from blue to red. And this information was provided back to those on the Gulf to help out with mitigation efforts. But there are a lot of questions and challenges here. One is how do we, um, you know, how do we better do this for future oil spills, disasters, and so on and so forth? Um, and this comes to the challenges that I mentioned previously in the data intensive research slide. One, we need to forestall data entropy. We do that through metadata, through secure archives like Data One and other data nets and other repositories. We make the data discoverable, uh, providing at least data uh, discovery level metadata. Third, we mediate a lot of that data heterogeneity. We can do that several ways. One is through promoting uh, community standards, supporting ontology development, as Deb mentioned previously, investing in a lot of these value-added integrated databases. And then finally, with respect to uh, data interpretation, we clearly need to expand our tool chest of uh, workflow and visualization and provenance solutions. And I put this in to sort of uh, cap off the talk here, but this is my perception with where we are in the sciences. Um, I think currently there's the perception anyway that um, you know, data should be discoverable. And you know, a scientist might argue that the value and cost are you know, roughly balance out. But beyond that, I think many scientists argue that the cost associated with de developing context-level metadata, uh, the metadata that allow you to manually uh, integrate those data with others, or to automate it, are much more costly than the actual value that gets derived from that. This is my perspe perspective. Um, I think we need to switch that graphic here and actually have that be the value and that be the cost or 
some variation thereof. And I think there are a couple ways to do that. One is through really focusing intently on a lot of research to promote semi-automated, automated solutions, to incorporating metadata smart sensors. Uh, and then importantly, probably most importantly, is the social side of it, where we uh, reintroduce the philosophy of science in terms of here are, here are good science practices, this is the best way to do it, and this is why you should do it. And then there's sort of a merger between technological and sociocultural solutions. Uh, usability is really key. This is something that typically gets ignored uh, through funding agencies and um, so on. And then automating things like through tenure promotion, where you can go out there and, and see the benefit of what a scientist has contributed in terms of, let's say, databases that are then cited and used by the community. And then finally, I just uh, acknowledge a, a handful of the people that have been involved in this. This is roughly, uh, I think, about 200 people involved in the various aspects that I showed uh, throughout the talk. And um, avoiding a four-point font in order to show you that, I've highlighted at least a few that I think uh, contributed most to this presentation. So thank you very much. So what I'd like to do uh, is ask everyone one more time to give a, a hand to both Bill and to Deb. I'd like to invite them both out for questions. Are there uh, questions from the audience? We have a few minutes for questions. Um, really enjoyed the talks. Uh, not to be excessively provocative, but um, I'm not... I'm not convinced that data entropy, discovery, heterogeneity, and interpretation leads to a portal. And I think that um, with um, emergences uh, like Web 2.0 and uh, citizen science, we really need non-portal-based solutions. Social networking is not a portal-based solution. So that, that's one comment. Another comment is that, uh, to me, a grand challenge is really in um, transparency of the data and vulgarization of the data. I, I use the word vulgarization from the French because it can be quite distasteful for scientists to document their data in such a way that's understandable to a broader public. But we're living in a technological environment in which we have to be more responsive to non-scientists or people outside our domains. Um, I don't think that was provocative at all. I agree with every single one of your comments. Um, I don't propose that a portal is the single solution there. I think all of the uh, solutions that you mentioned are really key, particularly a lot of the social um, networking solutions because that is really, I think, going to um, drive the new communities of practice that are going to be necessary to address a lot of these grand challenges. So um, I think without further ado, I mean, I, I agree with every single one of your comments, so not provocative at all. Well, I, I think to address your other point, um, I think that, I guess I'm, I'm a little less optimistic than Bill is that we're going to actually talk scientists into figuring out everything they should document when they collect the data. Because the reality is for alternate use, there are things that the person didn't even think of at the time as being important about that data. And, and so that's some of why I talked about sort of that web of data because the reality is you've got to capture every time anybody uses that data, all of the additional documentation that they create about that data because it, it does start to create something where you would have a full set of documentation. I think that, that's a more likely path given, given the, the natural tendencies of our scientists. I mean, there's some reality we've got to put in this mix as well. Um, yeah, I, but I think it, education is really key, you know, and we really do need to reintegrate how to manage data and information into science courses that are taught. You know, we've lost sight of that. You know, when I look at the students coming through now, it's like they're clueless in terms of you know, how to manage data, why you should manage it, and so on and so forth. And, you know, that's a real problem. Um, funding agencies like NSF, I think of, gosh, I'll probably get slammed for this one, but I think they've also contributed to the problem in the sense that they've created this mindset 
that the only useful products coming out of the scientific enterprise are publications. Um, and just now, just now, this year, we'll see data management plans being required in NSF grants. But that's been a long time coming in order to, you know, make that big step. Oh, hi. Uh, wonderful talks. Uh, I'd like both of you to comment on the need to, at a certain point, start developing, um, I would call them professional tools, but whatever. You cannot go on relying on graduate students to develop things that will be long-lived and documented and extensible so that scientists will embrace their use. So, and most financing agencies will not uh, pay for professionals to help you develop these uh, tools. So, how much uh, money or how much of manpower do you estimate that large projects such as the ones you were mentioning would need to really involve scientists so that they can see something that's really usable and useful for them? So I've looked into this a little bit as part of a couple of NRC panels and um, other efforts. And the big projects that I'm aware of, things like the Long-Term Ecological Research Network, they're developing data that ideally will be accessible and usable you know, 50, 100 years from now. Those type projects typically spend somewhere between 10 and 25% of their budget on information science aspects. And I think those numbers are, are really quite reasonable. Um, you know, in order to, again, treat data as products of that scientific enterprise. And some of that goes into um, programming support, sysadmin, and so on. But, you know, I think the point being is that that, in comparison to what most projects budget for data management and so on, uh, they're way under that figure. And I think we really need to educate the scientific community and the funding agencies about the real costs associated with retaining these data products because they are important. They're, they should not be thrown away, which is what historically has happened. So I, I think to address some of the, the rest of your question, um, I think there is a huge need to provide the, the underlying computer science and, and information science artifacts that are that are production enough, that, that people can just rely on them, that they're common. And, and I'm actually hopeful that projects like Data One and, and the, the other DataNet projects will hopefully be able to identify some of those and, and actually harden some of those into the community since they have the built-in education. Um, I'm actually looking to them to hopefully provide some of them. And I think uh, each of the large projects, I mean, any, any one of the, the large projects that Bill mentioned or that I mentioned, has run into this problem and has started to chew off a little piece of it. And so I do think you'll start to see things emerging. Um, I'm actually glad that it's sort of at least tied in with some of these projects because, um, not to disparage my own community or anything, but as a computer scientist, I'm all too aware that, that we can often run off with an initial problem defined and build a solution that in fact doesn't understand the problem anymore because, because we've disconnected from the problem. And so I think it's probably too early for us to know what all the requirements are such that we could run off and build that production ready piece. Um, so I think a lot of the work that's going on right now, you'll see there's not gonna be that much production readiness to pieces, but I think you're more likely to see tools that are actually seeing use because they are integrated with some of the science efforts. So I'm actually kind of hopeful that we will get there. I'm not sure I know the answer well enough yet to, you know, sit down with some Microsoft engineer or some, you know, some other engineer and say, ah, this, if you build this, that'll provide that, you know, that, that ready tool. We've tried that once or twice already. We did electronic logbooks. I think we've had at least four different iterations of projects over the 15 years I've been involved. And, and none of them, very few of them have caught on at all because we haven't understood the problem well enough. Question here. Hi there, so uh, I'm in strong agreement with uh, much of what you said, uh, but I wanna try and get some clarification of your perspectives by, by playing devil's advocate, advocate for a minute, and arguing that sort of what you're 
proposing is unnecessary and too much work. Um, unnecessary in the sense that, you know, is data really all that different from the kind of, is data publication really all that different from the kind of publication that we've always done where, yes, we know that we're drawing on all of science in order to publish our articles, but we just cite one level down and we rely, we rely on the fact that they cited farther down and, and farther down in order to refer to all of the stuff that we're doing. Do we really need to give a citation for every data item that we're, that we're putting into our, our, our publication? And on the, on the uh, too much work side, I, I, I'm, asking about the, the incentives for somebody to do this, right? There's a tremendous social good, but there's also a tremendous individual burden, at least with the tools that we've got right now, um, in asking somebody to prepare their data, to put it out in, in some sort of reusable form. Um, I, I'm very doubtful that any tool, that any uh, push to, uh, to, to affect this kind of change can work unless it becomes really trivial for uh, anybody to, to, to put their data out without really thinking about it. And is, is that possible? Do you want to start or um, me to? Do you want to start? Sure. I'll give this one a start, and I, I'm sure you will have uh, more thoughtful answers afterward. Um, so I am. Um, I agree with you and disagree with you almost immediately because um, the reality is data is very different from those publications. And there's a couple of reasons. One, because we do not have a tradition in most of the fields of, in fact, writing a publication that's purely about my data and publishing that as a first class entity, right? So that's number one. There are some fields that have started to provide that, but it's still in its fledgling stages. It is really not very universal at all. A second piece is this fact that when I, when I study my data and I write everything I know about this data, I don't know everything that will be known about this data, right? So it's, it's that piece of, of trying to connect in those other pieces. Um, I absolutely agree that the, the cost right now to publish your data is too high, but the reality is when, when any of us take a look at it, and I think Bill really illuminated it, is this fact that it can't today be trivial for you to publish your data. Because even if we gave you all the technical means, which I'd argue are largely there, the, the reality is there's just not enough. When you produce your data, there's not enough metadata. There's not enough explanation for, for it to, to be of any value that you stuck it out there. You might as well just shove it out onto an FTP site and, you know, and, and you're done. right? So today, I can make it trivial that you can publish your data. The reality is, will anybody ever find it? Will anybody ever be able to use it? And I think figuring out a way to make that trivial, such that, that all those other pieces come with it. Right? So Bill's got a piece of it of saying, you know, you, you push that all the way down to the education process that I'm generating those artifacts as I generate the data, such that it's not this one big cost right at the end that I have to pay after I've gotten all the use out of it. So that's, that's a piece of the answer. But, but another piece of the answer and it, it goes to your, your, your thing about the publications, right? That I can, I, can, I can stand on the fact that these other publications exist, and then they cited these other publications, and I've got this web. And that's sort of what I was getting at with my last slide, is this idea that you need that same thing with the data. And today I would argue that you have exactly the problem of that I can't cite all the data that I use when I start getting up to a synthesis level. I've just got too much data. I mean, I'm working. Uh, Marty's been helping us. We're working with the FlexNet community. They've got, this is just one very narrow group of people looking at, at a set of problems. And they've got, uh, on the order of 250 potential authors, um, 967 individual site years that you could individually cite, right? I mean, it's just, it, it, the problem is beyond belief in terms of what I can do. And just even in that narrow focus, trying to look at, how do we create that, that, that building blocks, right? Because we don't today have the building blocks that I can build up from this paper and then through this paper and through these papers such that I'm just citing these other papers. And so that's a piece of that thinking about how do we build up that web of data so that I can trace the data and not just the publications. So I'll give just a real quick case study here that we're actually working on right now. And this is the Dryad project, which is out of the Research Triangle in North Carolina. They're one of our member nodes in the project. And what they are doing is they're publishing data that are associated with published papers from, I think we have about 15 or 20 journals online now from a whole array of different professional societies in the biological, ecological, environmental sciences. And 
the dry out project has created some relatively simple and easy to use um, data entry, metadata entry forms in order to get a minimal amount of metadata into the system. Maybe not comprehensive enough to do automated data acquisition or interpretation or whatever, but nevertheless, it's a step in the right direction. In addition, the Dryad Project is working with California Digital Library effort, which is um, one of the leaders with DataSite in order to provide digital object identifiers for those data sets that are published. And this is a great way to get credit, again, to those data contributors. So now, when someone publishes a paper, they automatically get a DOI associated with the paper, but if they go through Dryad, they'll also get a DOI associated with the data product and presumably get twice as many citations. Ultimately, I think the DOIs for data products will factor into tenure promotion and other types of decisions down the road, which I think will also create this positive feedback loop that we need. Um, you know, I, you raise a lot of good points in playing devil's advocate. The point being, though, that I think you know, we need new tools that make it easier to do it. We need education. We need support and encouragement from funding agencies in order to do that. Big enough of a carrot is it turns into a stick, of course. Uh, but that, that's the direction we need to head. But, but let me add one short thing to that, because we looked in FlexNet because we said, well, what if we had DOIs for each of the site years? Would this solve it that if someone used all the site years, they would be able to just put all the DOIs? My calculation said it was going to take a page and a half at eight point font just to put all the DOIs on there in the paper. So I came, I came down to the conclusion that was still not the solution uh, in reality. We need to think further than the DOIs. They are not the universal solution to this yet. All right, well, um, I, there's four or five more questions. I'm sorry, we need to let people have their, have their lunch. Um, thanks uh, to all of you for your interest. Um, there's going to be several other sessions uh, in the same track, so I encourage you to uh, keep the dialogue going. Uh, find these guys after lunch, uh, but we really appreciate your interest. And again, uh, to Bill uh, and, and, and to both of you, to Deb, thank you very much. <laughs>